I'm not a tour guide. I want to challenge your faith, hoping that by the end of this, this time together, that your love for Jesus is deeper, that your passion for the lost, lost souls is even more passionate, and that you are encouraged in your walk with the Lord. So I just want your hearts to be open, that this is just not some tour, but rather a, a trip together and getting to know our city some more. All right, and what's going on in New York right here? What's happening? What's going on in New York? It's the most strategic city in the world because of people. 22 million people. One of every 300 people in the world lives within 50 miles of Times Square. There are 500 people groups speaking over 800 languages. Over 800,000 Muslims, 450,000 Hindus, 250,000 Buddhists, and 100,000 Sikhs. Boto Joseph is from India a descendant of the Naga people, a northeastern Indian tribe which was introduced to the gospel by American Baptist missionaries in 1841. Today, Boto, the Christian, is a pastor's kid who left India at age 20 as a missionary church planter for Queens, New York. Queens is today home of the most religiously plural and ethnically diverse zip code in the world. Where in Flushing, in one neighborhood, you can meet people reportedly from 133 different nations, the melting pot. In Jackson Heights, Queens, Little India, Boto leads a short-term mission team from Orlando, Florida inside the Sikh temple. Welcome to the tour. It started in uh, North India. It's been growing. In fact, New York City has the second most population of Sikhs, S-I-K-H, which means a learner, a disciple. That's what Sikhism means. It has the second largest population after California, and it's growing. But Sikhism began in the 16th century uh, with this man named Guru Nanak. There are two basic, it started in India. There are two basic uncompromising beliefs in Hinduism. One is the caste system. You guys have heard of the caste system where people are divided according to, you know, uh, the caste that they're born into and the lowest being Shudras, untouchables, and the highest being the Brahmins who are the priests who perform ceremonies. Guru Nanak, as he was born in, in North India, uh, he could not digest that himself. You know, and he said, why are people divided into categories and why, why, why is their destiny destined in, in that way according to what they're born? The second one was inequality. Uh, in India or in Hinduism, if you follow Hinduism strictly, women are no different from a cow or from a cattle or from property. Uh, that's what most of the ancient cultures believed in that way, that women were just part of property. Uh, Guru Nanak said no. So there were two basic tenets that he did not want to uh, believe in and that's why he had to come out of Hinduism. There are five main beliefs. Uh, when you go in, we have the subway there now, we have the planes over here. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, a strict Sikh will have a turban first. In, uh, the reason they have the turban is because they say that God has created you in a natural way where the hair grows. You don't have to cut your hair. That leads me to their second belief where they have a little comb that they keep in their turban. It's part of their belief system. The third one that you will see with a Sikh person, they have a bracelet. Uh, and that, that bracelet is to remind them to do good deeds, to do good. That is really the main belief do good. They believe in reincarnation because almost all of their belief system comes from Hinduism. But according to them, this is what is interesting. They believe that to be a human being is the last state of that reincarnation. So this is your last chance. Now your destiny will depend on how you live in this lifetime, whether you go to heaven or hell. Good deeds with their bracelet you will see with each one of them. Every Sikh has an, an, has an inner garment. Uh, it's like, a, like an underwear. 
that all of them have, like the ephods in the Old Testament. And the reason that they wear is so that they live a sexually pure life. They believe in marriage. They don't believe in celibacy. But even that, single people are told and commanded to live a holy life. I have told people in the past, man, some of the churches, we need to pass that out even to our younger people. God has called us to live a life of purity. And sometimes we take grace as a license to live the way whichever we want. You will be surprised to see some of them, how they live. Hindus. I mean, you know, a life of discipline, but it is motivated by fear. It is motivated out of obligation. It is motivated out of karma to do good deeds. For us, we ought to be motivated by grace. We ought to be, all, you know, we are motivated by love. And how much more our standard should have been. That's why for an average Hindu, they all think like Mahatma Gandhi, the founder of our nation. You know what Mahatma Gandhi said? He said, I love their Christ. I don't like their Christians because they don't live what they say. In fact, they invaded India for a hundred of years. On the one side, you had, on the one side, you had missionaries talking about the love of Jesus. On the other side, you had soldiers coming and taking over our land. Two messages. I want to challenge you. Is that what your life message is? Two messages. Sometimes we live a Christian life. But when we are with our friends, we have a totally different message. Our life has a totally different message. Sikhism has five enemies. Anger, greed, lust, ego, and materialism. Don't they sound like a list from the book of Galatians? <laughs> See, every religion tells to do good. Every religion, there's no religion that tells you to do evil except for maybe Satanism or, you know, uh, witchcraft or something like that. Every religion is telling you to do good and, it, and they will tell you that too. But it's like the cry of, of Paul. The good that I want to do, I cannot do it. The evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. Who will rescue me from this? Christ. Woo! Let's preach it. It's their cry also. Every honest Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Buddhist, if you talk to them one on one, that is the point they come down to. If they're honest, they will say, I'm trying my best. I can't. Thank God. I'm so glad Paul doesn't end in that place. He says, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord and the whole book of Romans is about how God has done that through Christ and the cross of Calvary and that is the opportunity we have to share the gospel with them father I pray that our churches oh God will be passionate as you are Lord God help us Lord to be witnesses that are faithful to you in the way we live, in the way we preach. God, that we'll be faithful to the gospel. God, even as we go into the temple, open up our eyes. Begin with us so that we may see the lostness all around us, oh God. And that we preach the gospel, that we live the gospel. Thank you for the team that is with us, Lord God. Holy Spirit, lead us, Lord, even as we go in there. In Jesus' name we ask and we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's walk in. If you have your own headscarves, it's wonderful. You could use that. Could you use a hat? Uh, no, you could use that. Yeah. Come, guys. So we, we come here often. Sikhism began with Guru Nanak, the man in the, uh, the golden turban that you see. And it began when he was on a search for truth. That's what Sikhism literally means, seeking.
for truth, but it's spelled as S I K H. <coughs> and uh, uh, he's called the Guru. Uh, does anybody know what Guru means? A wise man, a teacher, a teacher, a rabbi, just like rabbi. Uh, so he was the one who began uh, Sikhism. I want you guys to watch a worshiper, how they come and worship. Sikhism has had 10 gurus, beginning with Guru Nanak. And this temple is dedicated to one of them. Uh, their most holy place is uh, is the temple up there which is in India it's called the Golden Temple um, and it literally parts of it is made of gold uh, it's a holy temple their understanding of God is God is an impersonal that is he doesn't have a personal relationship impersonal eternal omnipresent omnipotent God who is doesn't have any shape or form God who is not incarnate. Now these are all in their definitions. Um, and yet on the surface level there is the tolerance. On the surface level, you know, in Sikhism they say, well all religions are one. Uh, guys, we have to remember this. All religions in India, you know, because that is what they would say all religions might seem superficially similar but they are fundamentally different and I'm sure you guys all, all know that about it uh, the number one lie in India is all religions are the same and Sikhism has part of that that's why the one who laid the foundation of their most holy temple you know who he was he was a Muslim he was a Muslim saint just trying to you know get everybody except uh, so that is their temple right there as we sit here on this temple the most elevated place above above this floor as we are sitting is their scripture now they call that the 11th guru and he's the last guru for them their scripture is living so they call their scripture a living guru so much respect is given to it that it is you know i'm sure you, you, you ladies love that embroidery even over there that uh, the, the cloth that they use is also very expensive that is used to cover their scripture. It's called the Guru Granth Sahib. Even that is called a Guru, their, their holy scripture. Most of it was written by the 10 Gurus, but they even have writings from Hindu scriptures and from Islamic scriptures. When the scripture reading is done in the evening, the priest will put their scripture that they, that they have there, put it on his head. Now that scripture is always carried on the head, never below the knees. So they put that scripture on the head and they take it to this room is specifically made, built to put in their scripture utmost reverence is given uh, to their scripture I am challenged at times now we all know uh, on, on my on my reading and on my study of the Guru Granth Sahib it is written by men uh, unlike our scripture our scripture is the infallible, inerrant word of God, inspired by God. Now, when we have the word of God, I am challenged of how much reverence do we have for the word of God. I'll be honest with you. There have been times on Sundays when I'm going to go to church, and this is years back. Where is my Bible usually? 
It's usually in the trunk of the car or lying somewhere around collecting dust in the kitchen maybe. Or even worse, we go to the temple, we go to our churches and I grab someone else's Bible. <laughs> we say we have the word of God. And when I look at the way they give reverence to the word, to their scripture, it's a challenge for us. It really is a challenge for us. Any worshiper that comes uh, will always kneel down. Uh, and if he or she is willing to do, they'll give an offering. Uh, uh, remember I told you guys, uh, bringing teams here, I don't just, it's not just about seeing the temple. Uh, I wanna challenge our faith. And sometimes when teams come here, I, I just, you know, I, I make them see that and I tell them, when was the last time you bowed your knees to the Lord? You know the number one reason why people don't bow down their knees in churches? They don't want to get their clothes dirty. And it just, it just, uh, and I mean, obviously, maybe the setting is different, but, but you guys get the point. Uh, giving a reverence to God, being ready every time people were caught in the presence, the manifest presence of the Lord, or whenever the Lord showed up, the one response through the Bible is people falling face down. Yeah, people are going face down. And then so it's a reminder to us. You don't just learn like, if, guys, if you really want to have passion for lost people, understand how lost they are get to know how lost they are then you will have that burden in, in your heart to meet with that need but many evangelicals we go out you know trashing people pumping the bible on their heads telling them they're lost and but you don't even know what they believe in. i have made it a point to get to know what others believe and they respect you for that. I had a Hindu person come visit our church and he brought a bouquet of roses thinking that there is a Mary statue. That is the perception of the church. This place is open from 5.30 in the morning till about 10. The place begins with worship. Every morning, every day, it begins with worship. One of the reasons this place is open every day is because we'll go in a moment, when you go under this place, the basement of this place, it's a place called Langar. A Langar is a place where anybody from any nationality, color, tribe, language can come and they will serve you food any time of the day, any time of the week. Uh, that's part of their belief. Having said that, think about some of our churches, and it breaks our hearts. It breaks my heart. Sometimes the church is just open on Sundays for our service, or you know, we usually the doors of our churches are open for, for for meeting or for us. Good point. Rather than for them. How many people can truly look at our churches and say, you know, this is a place. Uh, uh, that is needed in our community. In fact, there was a time in our church core team meeting, I asked them this question. If our church door is closed, will it affect anybody in the community? Let me tell you something. If this place is closed, it will affect the community. Usually when I go to a Hindu temple, uh, I try to avoid food that is served in Hindu temples because it is offered to idols. But this one, they don't. They don't believe in idol worship. This is all about serving the community. What makes us different? If we say it's the church, they say they... Look at this, they have their church. 
If we say it's the sermons, they will say, you can listen to our sermons. If you say, well, we got the word of God, they will claim they have the word of God. If we say you should come and listen to our worship services or listen to some songs, you ought to come and listen to some of their songs. It's like singing the Psalms. It's amazing. It's just, you know, because Sikhism is all about seeking God and getting to know Him. There is this cry of, just like the psalmist, as the deer pants for the water, my soul longs, all their songs. Musical instruments right there. People come for that. Well, you say, well, we do a lot of compassion services, just like all of you are doing over here, all the way from Florida. They will tell you, come downstairs and we'll show you how much compassion we do every day. Well, we say, man, you should come for our Holy Communion. They will say, we got it right here. We do a sharing with everybody. You know, you and I will say, well, now this one, we got you in this one. We will say, we have our baptism. You should come and see that. Sikhism has a baptism. Hinduism has baptism too. And their baptisms are serious, let me tell you. Once a person, it's called Amrit Chakni. Once you have that, they live a particular lifestyle, vegetarian and so many other things. No alcohol, no tobacco. You know, you have to wear the full attire and all that. If you say, well, we, we do witnessing, there are priests over here that go all over. The last time I met a priest, he was all over UK. I mean, just all over. I think the largest population of Sikhism in North America is in Canada. They do witnessing. What is it that you and I can confidently say distinguishes us from them? Good. Praise God. Salvation by grace. Not through works. You're right. Resurrection. Resurrection of Christ. Yes. And I know we all know the answer. I'm trying to make a point here. You know, Moses prayed in Exodus 33. And this is what, this was his cry. Lord, if your presence doesn't go with us, what will distinguish us from the other peoples? What will distinguish your people group from the others? The presence of the living God. And if the church you know, because we can have so many things going on, but we lose out on the presence of God, of worshiping Him, of making Jesus the center of all, everything that we do. There is no difference between us and them. I want to encourage you with that. And I don't mean only in when we meet in the church, we are the church, taking that presence of God. Having living that life of, of worship, 